Thank you for joining me here with a Q&A with our guest, Molly Warner. Molly is an illustrator and she works in the game industry as a 3D environment artist. Among other popular franchises, she has worked on Marvel and Star Wars video games, and she currently works at Certain Infinity, Affinity, sorry, Certain Affinity as an environment artist. After our Q&A, Molly is going to also be sharing a drawing demonstration with us, so make sure to grab some pen and pencil if you want to follow along with Molly. Um, Molly, how are you doing? I'm great. How about you? Doing good, thank you. Um, so my very first question is, what is an environment artist? I'm not exactly sure on that. So, and I'm sure some of our audience members may not be either. Yeah, so an environment artist is the person who builds all the worlds that you go through in games. So as you're traversing the worlds, you're exploring everything, you come across buildings and like all the little props in the game, the environment artist makes all those things that you find in the game. Um, everything from like, little tiny things to the biggest models that you see in the game, they make all that. And uh, there's also another aspect to environment art called world building. And that's um, the person who places all those props in the game to create the story and like make the player follow the pathway and make that an interesting journey. Um, they build up all of the world around the character. Is there a particular area in that that you focus on in your work? I do both. Um, I've done prop work the most, like modeling and everything, um, but I've done a lot of both of them. Very cool. Um, so can I ask, how did you get started working in the video game industry? Um, what in got you interested in that? I've always loved games, and I think still, even today, people don't know that you can get into it as a job. And so I hadn't thought of it when I was a kid or anything. I had always just wanted to be an artist in the inter entertainment industry. And I was leaning more towards going into like character design. I thought for a long time that I would end up being like a visual development artist going into concept art and movies and stuff. And I was geared towards that for a long time. And I was like always playing a lot of games and I was always very technical on the computer. I played all PC games. Um, and I started playing like, I played Half-Life when I was eight years old. Like I started playing pretty hardcore games from a young age and I've always loved Pokemon and like I've played everything, but I loved games a lot. And then when I saw that it was an option in college, I was like, wait, people make the games. <laughs> <laughs> I realized, I was like, wait a sec. I think I'd actually like that better. Like as much as I loved character design and visual development, I was like, that would be really cool. I never really thought about that. And the more I did research into it, I was like, this is super viable. Okay, I love this idea. And then I just went for it. And uh, I had chosen to go to a college called Ringling College of Art and Design. And they're a pretty renowned college for game art. And uh, I loved it there. And, like, I loved the program and I really enjoyed going into environment art. I never thought, like I always thought I'd go into characters and then I learned my love for environment art there. So, yeah. Cool. Um, so you talked about this a little bit that you, where you went to school, but what um, kind of training is needed to go into that? Do you need to go for a, um, to a specific school for that? Um, and is the training for going into that, how is that different from being uh, other kind, doing other kinds of illustration? It varies between school. Every school is a different program, but there are definitely, with anything, schools, some schools that are better than others. Um, for what I did, we were trained to be a generalist and that's normally what I feel is the best path because it's good to know a bit of everything and then to specialize in certain things. Like you're, you know, a bit of how to do anything if you need to, and any company would find that beneficial, but then you're really good at like materials or lighting or modeling. Um, and then you can go into those things, specialize into those things and be the master of those things. Um, but yeah, different schools teach different things. Most schools teach uh, being a generalist and game art programs are pretty different from illustration, um, even though they're both artistic. So you learn the basics of art, like contrast, color, composition, all those things are really important because you're still composing a 3D image in the world that you're making. Um, but beyond that, like the first stage for illustration is concept art and that's also the final stage for illustration like you're just making the 2d artwork and for game art it starts with that stage 
and it goes way past that because the pipeline goes, it starts with concept art and then you have to make the model and integrate it into the world. And it has to pass through a whole bunch of technical standards and level designers have to work with it and everything. So it, it starts with that one art stage, but then you have to know a whole bunch of other programs. You have to learn like a dozen programs <laughs> in order to get through the whole pipeline to the finished product that you see in the game. For every single prop, they all go through that process. So, um, Well, I kind of want to jump ahead then to another question I had then. What are your favorite tools and software to use? I prefer Maya for my 3D modeling program. Um, a lot of people like 3D, 3ds Max or Moto, um, Houdini sometimes, but Maya is my go-to program and I mainly work in that program because uh, I do a lot of modeling. And beyond that, I use Substance for making material substance designer and substance painter. And Marmoset, Marmoset is really good for baking and uh, getting the final asset from the sculpt, which you do in ZBrush. Um, yeah, and I do use Photoshop sometimes for editing textures and that kind of thing. Mm, and then the engine I made use. Cool. Um, so one thing I was curious about is that what, what is the difference in how you approach a project when you're doing a project for, um, for work that's your, um, you know, you've got a video game project and you're doing an environment. How do you start that process versus if you're doing a uh, illustration for your Etsy shop for something you're going to sell, um, through your own personal Etsy shop? So the processes are pretty different between them because like I said, illustration is kind of just the concept stage. And so for the illustration things that I do for my shop, I normally, I do like my own style, like a really cutesy kind of simplified cartoony um, style and I'll design the characters. Um, that's a whole other thing to go into, but <laughs> character design stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll work within my palette that I've established is like my style palette, the colors that I prefer. And then from there, like I have to make sure that it's a really high pixel density because I want to put it onto product and whether you want it to be like a tiny little sticker, or you want it to be like on a shirt or something, it has to be really high res. And uh, yeah, so you have to work really cleanly if you want it to be on a product and then like think of all the technical requirements for merchandise depending on what you're planning to make it for. And uh, yeah, like things like silhouette are really important because if you make it into like a keychain charm, then like you don't want it to have like easily breakable little sections or mm -hmm. holes in it or something. So you have to plan out the design based on what you want to use it for. And uh, yeah, so that's the process for like Etsy style type illustrations for gamer and stuff. It's totally different where sometimes I'll start with a sketch for things. I'll like sketch out a building or a character or something and then I start modeling it pretty quickly. Like I normally only have a loose kind of doodle that I start with for the sketch. Sometimes it'll be a little bit more refined, but it's normally much more loose and really quick kind of illustrations. And then when I model it, I'm figuring out, like I have the silhouette, I have the idea. And then when I'm modeling it, I'm figuring out where to add things and like how to make the form look good for 3D. And I have like the basic guidelines and idea in the 2D sketch. Um, and then from there, like after you model it, you have to like UV it and texture it and go throughout the rest of the pipeline process before it gets into engine. And then you like, use it in the world, in the level that's that dressing it as a world builder and uh, has a whole lot more technical requirements like with performance and you want to make sure that everything still looks good while performing well for different computer types. And like mm -hmm. make sure in gameplay that everything has good collision so that characters aren't like randomly flying over things that shouldn't have <laughs> collision or like bumping into invisible walls. So there's a lot of like more technical requirements for gameplay to make sure that players can interact with it in the 3D space and nothing goes mm -hmm. wrong and it isn't wonky or looks really bad or anything. So there's mm -hmm. a lot more to the game art aspect and that's why it's it's relaxing for me as a side thing to just do that thing. It's like just focus on the art and just make the art look really good without having to worry about all the next steps that happen in the game art process. Yeah, that does sound fun. <laughs> Both sides, but you know, definitely that other one sounds a little bit more relaxing. <laughs> um, so uh, when you're designing environments, do you prefer working on uh, 
realistic environments or really fantastic out of this world kind of things? I love stylized environments. Um, I've always been really into fantasy stuff and making my own mm -hmm. worlds. And like I wrote novels for a while and I've just always been really into designing things from scratch and like trying to make everything as beautiful as possible. And it's hard to do that with realism because you're confined to the world that exists. And so anytime you try to do anything like purple trees, it's like, no, it's fantastical. <laughs> and so you, you can't design it how you want. You're constrained to the limits of the real world. And like, that can still be beautiful. Like I've been to Europe a few times and like, it's, it's amazing. It's beautiful, but anything that makes it like, even if you have things more glowy looking or like, you have a certain type of lighting, it can feel dreamy and that can make it feel fantastical. It's like, oh, you made it fantastical and you made it prettier, but because you went out of the realm of realism, it, it feels more fantastical. So all every time I try and make something look prettier, it ends up more fantastical. I I love stylized stuff, so yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> I've done um, mostly realistic work for what I've worked for in the industry, mm -hmm. though, so... Yeah, but in my free time, I do pretty much all stylized stuff. Okay. Um, so you mentioned before something about the color palette that you use for your own personal uh, designs in Etsy. Um, what color palettes do you prefer? Any particular shades, colors that you like? I am partial towards lime green, and I, I like really pastel warm tones, like mm -hmm. things that you can have that you feel like are part of a whimsical sunset. And... Uh, like yellows, really warm reds. And like, if I have uh, sky blues, it'll still feel like glowy and it'll still feel like it's bringing warmth to the picture, even though it's a cool tone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just generally like really warm, bright kind of colors. That's cool. That sounds beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Oh, I was want to know, are there any big trends that you see in the gaming industry and video game industry that you think is going to change the way your job is done just with the increase in technology and how things change? Uh, what do you think? The biggest one that I see on the horizon is Unreal Engine 5, which just recently released. And the gameplay demos for that were like... I don't know if they'll be able to deliver on everything that they've shown, but if it is the new standard, then like people won't have to deal with like polygon counts, like unlimited polygons, just throw as much as you want, like super dense models that are super detailed. You don't even have to bake it down. It's just coming right out of ZBrush, just toss it there. It doesn't even, get... that's what they made it sound like. And uh, that would be pretty revolutionary because that's a huge part of the pipeline. It takes a long time to refine and get everything right for baking assets from high to low poly. And they also say, like, light maps won't really be a thing, which is pretty nice because it's a pain in the butt to make light maps for <laughs> everything. So um, that's the biggest thing I see coming down the pipeline. And they haven't announced the release date for that. But in a year or two, I'm suspecting is when it'll come out. And that would be pretty huge if it did deliver all the things that they're saying. Yeah, that sounds very exciting. Yeah. Um, see, uh, with, like, you know, with all of the current stuff going on with the pandemic and social distancing, how has all of that affected your workflow and your creative process? Has it made an impact or are you able to pretty seamless, seamlessly continue with your work? It's been pretty seamless. It's actually been really nice to be at home because there isn't the commute anymore. And, uh, we, we've been told that like for the foreseeable future, we're working from home and that's how it is with every tech co company we've heard pretty much like, Google and Apple are like normally the ones that kind of set the standard. And they've said it's like until August, 2021 next year when they're thinking of letting people go back to the office to work. So everyone's kind of just like learned to live with it. And I think most people really like staying at home. And so they want things to kind of stay this way. Even afterwards, a lot of people are opting like, well, now that we have the system figured out and we can just call in for meetings, then can I stay home for four days a week and only come in for one or two days? And like, because some people are more productive at home. Some people do have kids and stuff and it doesn't work out so well for them. Um, so some people do need to go into the office and would prefer that. But a lot of people are also really enjoying like having their family around or their pets or whatever. And it's like, you can take much more smaller breaks and it just feels more relaxing in a way. Like you don't always have someone looking over your shoulder. It's just like 
you can just work and like you communicate what you're doing. And as long as you're really good with communication, it's easy to just let everyone know what you're working on and keep sending screenshots to everyone and everyone stays updated. So it's like, I, I think it's better. I like it a lot. <laughs> I really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, no, I can understand that. It's uh, definitely, you know, when you have the kind of role that allows you to continue to get your job done and everything, that's good. I personally miss being at the library, but, <laughs> but that's a very different kind of job. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, just uh, last couple questions. Um, one that one of my coworkers asked, have you ever hidden any Easter eggs in your environments? I have. Um, it's hard to think of. I haven't done it too often, but I think the one that comes to mind initially is on Star Wars The Old Republic. I worked on an expansion where... You're in a palace, a Zakul palace, and then there's like these kitchens. It's a huge palace that you're going through. It's almost like a hotel because it has like a bunch of rooms and it has dungeons and it has like, it's very Star Wars. Like it has everything in this one place. And when you go into the kitchens, I did the world building for the kitchen. So I got to place everything to make it feel like a kitchen, but we didn't have kitchen props for Star Wars, like we have <laughs> Star Wars type props. We don't normally make kitchens. And so I did a lot of weird things to make it work based on like, what do we have that I can use to make things? And so like cabinets became fridges and for all the food that I used, it was just like random food-ish looking methods <laughs> that we had. And so I had all kinds of like Star Wars creatures that are just like in the food bowls. And like, I would put like swamp weed on it and it's like, it's a salad now, I guess. <laughs> and uh, I, I made all kinds of weird Star Wars animal foods that I don't think anyone would find appetizing, but I was like, if anyone ever looks at all these plates that are set up in the kitchen that are ready to go out for people to eat, everyone would be like, what is that? Oh, no, no, no one should be eating that. And uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun with that. But it was also working with the constraints of what we already have. So. <laughs> cool. And um, last question. Uh, what is your dream project? If you could work on anything, what would it be? That's a tough one. There's a lot of things that I really enjoy. Like I've played a lot of different games, so I love... I love everything. Like, I would love to just keep working on Star Wars stuff because I'm a huge Star Wars nerd. So like I could work on Star Wars stuff for a long time. Um, but I do love, like I said, creating my own projects. So it would probably be something that I would have more control over if it were my dream project. It would be something that like I had a lot of um, a lot of the control over being able to come up with the ideas behind things. And like some of my favorite games that I really wish had been fleshed out more are things like Gigantic. That was such a great MOBA type game that like had a beautiful style and really gorgeous character designs. And it ended too soon. They had a lot of production issues and issues out the gate and uh, they ended up shutting down. And there are some other projects that I really enjoy. Like I love Apex. I love Overwatch. Like I love competitive shooters as well. And so I'd love to work on any of those games too. Like it's really tough to decide like versus the IPs that I already love and the things that I could create myself that are like, unimagined, but on the horizon. Um, I'd love any of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm excited to see what the next project is that you're working on. I know you can't sit, tell me yet, but I'm excited to find out what that is going to be. And real. Okay. Last, last question, just because now I know you like Star Wars. What is your favorite Star Wars movie? Uh, it's between episode two and three for me. <laughs> That's like a very controversial thing. But like those movies, when they came out, I was like 12 or something, 12 yeah. to 15. So I was like in a super influential age. And mm -hmm. I got the art books for those, those concept art books. And those were like, those heavily inspired me to want to do concept art and go into the entertainment industry. And like Craig Mullins and all those artists in there, like they were my idols for a while. And like those, as much as people hate on like, bad acting or whatever like the concepts for like the different worlds that people went to all of the vehicles all the new characters they had an unprecedented unprecedented level of new characters and creatures and places and it was also inspiring to see all of that crammed into those films like there was so much new inspirational content for artists in those films and so those heavily inspired me and like i i saw it i saw that it was 
kind of cheesy in some areas like Jar Jar and stuff. And I was like, it's fine. It's beautiful. <laughs> I still enjoy all of it. And it's entertaining. Like, and that's the main thing is it pulls me into those worlds. It pulls me into a whole new place that I want to be. So I love it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking this time to answer some questions with me. So uh, next up, you guys, Molly is going to be doing a drawing demonstration. So I hope you enjoy that. Thank you. Thank you. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that my painting program I'm using here is called Paint Tool Sci. It's my preferred drawing program because I love how it's made for illustrators, so it has really beautiful line weight and uh, it feels very slow and lightweight compared to Photoshop, which I do use all the time. But uh, when I'm painting, I love to draw in Paint Tool Sci. And my tablet that I use is a Huyan tablet. It's 22 inches. So I always start with circle for the head and then directionality of the face. And then I can figure out the pose, like if I want the neck to go this way and it could be like paw up here or something, try and do something really loose, really sketchy and dynamic. And maybe another paw here, like maybe they're really excited and they're like jumping up or something. Like maybe the nose is here and the eyes are here. And like, this is just one quick idea for a little sketchy sketch. Um, so I have a good general idea of where this is going. Turn down the opacity on that one and start with another sketch on top of it. This is where the design phase starts. So just kind of play with things for a while until I get something that I like. are a little bit messy but I can always go back and clean them up that's easy enough so what I like doing at this stage is uh, coloring that is the next step okay so I just like the outside selection invert you can do this in Photoshop <clears throat> in Photoshop the shortcut is control I to invert inside um, I also do dilate selection or erode because it's the opposite way. Um, you can do this in Photoshop as well and just pull it in five. That's good. <clears throat> That's just to make sure it stays within the lines. <clears throat> so now's where you get to do all the colors 
And I know for sure, so let's start with what we know for sure. I know for sure that I want this to be a pinkish color. Wait, so for flats, sorry. For flats, I normally fill it all in at once. Let's see. I like the idea of purple, green, and blue for this little guy. Let's just start with a blue base. No. And these are like some of my favorite colors that I like to pull from easily. That one's pretty good. And I darken up the lines. Make it a bit easier to see them. So now that I have the flats, I can lock it so that everything stays, whoops, so that everything stays within the border. So that makes it easy. So start with the things that I know I want. I want the little blushy cheeks to be pink. I know that I want the eyes to be white. I normally don't like doing pure white. It's just too much, too stark contrast. So let's see. The tummy should be a lighter color pretty much always on every animal. The tummy color is always lighter. There's some like badgers, I think. There's a few where it's darker, but I'm just going to do this pretty quick. Oh, I did leave out some of the details that were in the sketch. That's fine. Um, some of the pattern details. So it's a lot of time for patterns. I'll make it a separate layer. Okay, first off, it needs to be a bit darker. Green. Wow. That's cute. Okay. So, maybe the bottom of the pop pads are more maroon? That could be cute. Maroon and teal work pretty well together. You can do that for the horns too. Maybe add some texture. That's me changing my brush size if you can hear that <laughs> clicking my mechanical keyboard. So that's pretty cute. I'll do the same for down here. Okay, and then maybe a brown. That's too saturated. Little claws. I also like to go back and recolor the lines afterwards, lock the line layer, and then for areas where it's like brown and red, I would make them more brown and red. Not just like that, but I mean, it just makes them feel much more cohesive in the design overall. So let's make these also red. I think I'll go for more bluish purple, navy color. Maybe I want the inside. I do want the inside lighter. Sometimes it's just easier to select the inside and then color from there. Lasso tool on the other side. Yeah. Because I have the liner, the flat layer I mean, locked, I don't have to worry about the lasso tool pulling on side lines there. Let's see. On the elbows, 
That's a bit weird. I don't know about that. But I do want to make the tail lighter color. <clears throat> do the same thing in here. Okay. That's something I'd want to do in the patterns layer. Details like this. Because if I don't like it, it's easy to erase it. I want texture for that one. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Here's where I definitely want to recolor the lines and just make it a slightly darker, more saturated color. Make these not stand out so much. It's too much. Okay. Also, like, okay, I can't layer on top of the line art layer. I also like to add a separate layer and can make eye shines, whatever color I want. Let's see. Oh. blend a bit more. I can always go back and change up the color a bit more. Let's see. More yellow. Yeah. Maybe too bright. You can always play with some of the other effects to see if anything else looks better. I think I'll keep it there for now. Though. Okay, and now on the patterns layer. Also, I'll make this into a clipping mask so that it only takes from flats. I won't be able to go outside the lines, outside of whatever's in flats. This one, I could just use a darker blue. I think that's fine. It does make me want to change the color of the eyes though, but let's try this. Let's see. Put the sketch layer on top. I can see what I had in there. Maybe I can get this to work. Not sure. this line up with that pattern so it feels more believable. Now I feel like the pop hats are too great. do some saturation adjustments, hue adjustments to the eyes to see what feels better. I think the red might feel better. Purpley. Yeah, I like that better. Let's 
see. Maybe put some of the pink in there. That's cute. Okay. I think I'm also going to get rid of some of this texture in the ears. I think it might be too much. sketch layer now I think a bit with the shape the shape of the patterns I did want to make that darker damn it okay that helps too where I'd go back and recolor the lines. Just make darker versions of the color that they're on. I think that needs to be more blue. There we go. Do you like the outside of the outlines to stay a darker color than the inside helps with the silhouette. And to help blend, I'll use the airbrush for these thinner, wispier, less defined lines. As I go through, I'll do little cleanups here and there, or I notice things need. softer on the outside. Not sure yet. saturated.
Okay, almost done. Sometimes I like to add a little bit of a shadow to the eye, just to give it more dimension. I think another thing I want to do for this, this little guy a bit more color pop on the chest. Some, pair, some colors into different places. Yeah. Maybe add some texture here. I do you want to color these outlines? soften up these outer lines a bit. It's too much of a harsh contrast, I think. Make them a bit darker though still. I'll grab a color in between and then reuse that. Okay, I think he's pretty much done. Mm. Yeah, I don't think I missed anything. Okay, so I'm gonna hide all these so you can see them better. Little cute dragon. Yay! <laughs> so I finished coloring the line art. I did a few touch-ups and adjustments, and this is the finished piece. I hope you enjoyed watching my demo. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.